beautiful Ian Walk Theatre here in the Shine Dome, and today in Canberra, the Shine Dome looks exactly like it does in the picture above me, and the sun is shining, except that the copper is a little bit brighter um, today, having been recently replaced. So my name is Tracy Ireland, and I'm Professor of Cultural Heritage at the University of Canberra. And I'd first like to acknowledge that we're meeting today on Ngunnawal land, and I'd like to extend my respects to elders, past and present, and also uh, extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people with us today, and to those who are also in our large uh, online audience. So today's event is a hybrid event. It's, uh, as I said, we have an, an in-person audience, we have an online audience, and the event is also being filmed and uh, will take on another life after we're finished today um, as a wonderful resource on the project uh, website. So because of that, uh, Questions today will be kept uh, to the end of the event, but also we're asking you to email your questions in uh, because, of course, uh, because of COVID regulations, we're not passing around a microphone. Um, and so please email your questions to events at science.org.au. Um, a housekeeping announcement also, in case of emergency, those of you here, please follow staff directions and exit through either of the two side doors. Um, both are open today. So we've been very uh, fortunate to um, be working together with a great team um, on the, sustain the Sustainable Shine Dome project, looking at uh, working towards a carbon neutral future for this treasured um, icon of Canberra's architectural heritage um, and also of our cultural um, and educational life here in, in the Canberra community. The project is led by my colleague, Professor Michael Jasper, Professor of Architecture at the University of Canberra. And one of our other co-investigators is Professor, Emeritus Professor Hans Bachel, um, who is Se Secretary of Education and Public Awareness at the Australian Academy of Science. And I'd like to ask Hans to welcome us here on behalf of the Academy. Thank you, Hans. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you for coming here and thank you for coming as an online audience. We're looking forward to this meeting and it will be great to have you as MC of this meeting, Tracy. So the Academy is delighted to welcome you here at the Shine Dome, a quite a historic building. And it's about 60 years old. But let me put that into perspective. We have the great rule here that we respect the traditional owners, in our case the Ngunnawal people, and we share our knowledge, teaching and learning. So we're looking back about three generations when you look at the Shine Dome. The Academy of Science is built on science that looks back 50, 100 generations. The traditional owners have knowledge going back more than a thousand generations. And I think that's worth reflecting upon. Uh, that's a great example of sustainability. And I think we'll need to combine all of that in our way of looking forward to the future. What happens now, what happens in the future, can learn from all of the past. So on behalf of the Academy, which represents a, a bit over 500 fellows all across Australia, I'd like to welcome you here. The Academy of Science is the owner and has been the only owner of this building since it was built purposely for the Academy. And we see ourselves as the custodian of this building. Much like Canberra, a meeting place for the nation, the Shine Dome is the meeting place for science. And so we have many events bringing scientists and the public together. And um, when it was opened, I think it was in a way a little easier than today because 
progress after World War II was generally all positive. Now we have um, very good tools to look a little bit more into the future. We can predict the future a bit better than it was possible when this really uh, sophisticated and iconic building was designed and built. And we discover some challenges. And 220 gave us many examples of that. Hail, the roof, floods, and most of all, the health of everybody in the world. So we are very pleased to work with all of you together to design the future of the building, to value the heritage and take it to the next level, to have it for at least as long as it's old in the future as a meeting place, and to work together on the big picture for Australia, for everybody, and they are beautifully summarized in the global sustainability goals, which will pop up again and again, I think, in your presentations. So I'm very much looking forward to this forward-looking meeting, taking heritage for another few decades and making it what is designed for the iconic home of science in Australia. Thank you, and um, all the best for the meeting. Thank you very much, Hans. So today we're very fortunate that we have uh, three guest speakers who've all travelled from afar to Canberra, which is a treat um, after recent um, uh, lack of contact with other humans outside of the bubble here in, in Canberra, so we're very grateful. And the structure of today will be uh, three talks following on one from another. Then we will have a respondent, Professor Barbara Norman, uh, followed by a round table. Um, and it's at the round table that you can submit your questions um, to the speakers. So please remember to email your questions to that um, email address. And also, please, um, for those people who follow the conversation on Twitter, we have a hashtag sustainable, um, what was it, sustainable dome? Yes, hashtag sustainable dome. And that will be how we structure the, um, the next couple of hours this afternoon. So first of all, it's my great pleasure to introduce Scientia Professor from the University of New South Wales, Deo Prasad, and he's going to talk to us on the topic climate emergency, developing credible science-based benchmarks, targets, and pathways for a zero carbon built environment. Would you like to join us, David? Oh, good, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Tracy. Uh, it's, it's so nice to be back here in this great building uh, again. Uh, I was here a couple of years ago, and, and uh, glad we are back here. And we're talking about science uh, underpinning climate uh, change. Uh, we, we clearly accept much more broadly now uh, that climate change is real, and those debates are in the past. Uh, we are much more about uh, uh, how to deal with it, how to mitigate and adapt, and all of those sorts of things. Buildings and, and built environment is a very significant sector within this discussion. Uh, so my talk uh, and my colleagues as well will be a lot about uh, buildings and built environment and their contributions. Uh, one, what accepting climate uh, change based on good science and all of that, we are now shifting towards uh, the attitude that it's 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 an emergency. Uh, that we need to deal with uh, these and, and act uh, in a much shorter time span uh, because uh, the, the risks are so high uh, in terms of not dealing with it. We have seen uh, over the last decade or so, acceptance has been there in many quarters, uh, but uh, uh, we haven't done much meaningfully uh, in, in terms of trying to 
mitigate uh, and, 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 and try and get on a net zero carbon path, as they say. Uh, and uh, what uh, we are doing, uh, this is just an uh, intro to where our, uh, what I'm going to talk about is coming from. Uh, uh, we, we, we're publishing some uh, of these science-based uh, benchmarks, targets, uh, and, and pathways uh, in terms of getting there soonest possible, much sooner uh, than 2030 perhaps, uh, and, and what's the evidence that we can, uh, not just the standard 2050 political targets. Uh, as we head towards COP26 uh, end of this year, it is much more about good science and an emergency. Uh, so our work is well-timed to link with that. We are producing two sets, a, a book with, with uh, Macmillan's, uh, which is much deeper into, into the breakdown of carbon uh, in buildings and looking at world-class exemplars and so forth. Uh, but the guide, which is a, a, just a 20-page guide, which is the reading time span of a practitioner, perhaps uh, in office, uh, and, and, and with a few fold-outs uh, right in front of their drawing boards as they work, uh, in terms of really telling them uh, what and how to get there, what is feasible, where, what, the, what the actual benchmarks are that you're trying to better in terms of good design and so forth. So, so uh, the guide uh, should be out in a month, uh, and the book will be within, in press uh, end of May may or so. But uh, as we talk about emergency, uh, we, we are looking at uh, real-time effects. Uh, I was reading an article yesterday which was uh, trying to connect uh, the floods and, 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 and the droughts and things much more meaningfully uh, using good science data and, and what's happening in the waters on the east coast uh, of Australia uh, to, to some of the events that are, that are happening. So there is a lot of evidence. Uh, we architects work, uh, I mean, when they are at the drawing board designing, they're not only focusing on carbon per se, they, they have to couch it within a broad context of sustainability. So I'm just putting this up that it is not a singular thing that when we talk about reducing carbon, uh, that that's the driving feature. We have to couch it in terms of good design uh, and practice as well as a, a broader set of uh, sustainability criteria which uh, I believe uh, others might talk about after me. But within built environment, the carbon uh, phenomena is quite significant uh, and uh, the emissions uh, within this sector uh, as you see uh, is, is, is very significant. Uh, either, either we look at energy consumption which is, which is fine but, but also uh, the uh, emissions from buildings uh, about one third or, or, or one fifth sorry uh, of the emissions come from this, this area. Uh, and uh, we, we talk about targeted approach, uh, and I will come back to that uh, in terms of reducing carbon within buildings. But let me put it in, into international context. Uh, there are, there's a lot going on globally now. Uh, when we say uh, that there is high level of acceptance, every major organization is setting its short-term, medium, and long-term goals about uh, zero carbon. Uh, and and uh, uh, they, uh, they were largely medium to long term. And, and in the last uh, months or so, a lot of these goals have shifted uh, left in the table towards before 2030, which is a sign of climate emergency that we not only need to tackle these, but tackle these uh, much sooner. They're setting goals, uh, measurable goals, uh, around operational and embodied carbon. Historically, there have been aspirational targets. Let's do 50% reduction or 20% reduction, uh, uh, and let's pick 2040, 2050 as a timeline, uh, without giving details to practitioners who, who know what to target and how to get there. Uh, 
So, so we are trying to uh, articulate that uh, a, a lot better now. So I'll come back to the split between uh, embedded and operational carbon uh, shortly. But Australian government, uh, all states and territories are having their own goals now, which is which is a sign of the acceptance uh, how meaningful some of them are and what activities and actions are underpinning those uh, is not always as clear. Uh, but uh, uh, federally, we know the 26 to 28 percent uh, goal that was uh, from some time ago hasn't changed. Uh, but uh, ICT here clearly uh, is is uh, quite quite a bit ahead in terms of 100% uh, renewable uh, and, and and so forth. Uh, so a lot is scheduled to happen, uh, but not talking about exactly how some of those might happen in other states and territories. The Gr uh, Green Building Council, they have their own roadmaps now worked out, and they have levers. Uh, they have their tool which they can keep on uh, pushing uh, uh, in terms of uh, stringency and so forth so that you can drive towards zero carbon in a, in a, in a particular uh, according to a particular road map, uh, and, and, uh, but it is voluntary. Uh, the the neighbours folks, which is now getting uh, quite global as a, as a system, uh, it is uh, probably one of the most widely accepted, and they have a lot of data that supports uh, uh, a earlier uh, sort of arrival for zero carbon, and I'll come back to that again. Uh, National Code, obviously, the trajectory work by COAG uh, is leading to a much more stringent sort of approach to building codes over a longer period of time. Uh, and I was glad to be part of the, uh, the, the CRC that I led, uh, which set in train the notion of the trajectory of the building code, uh, so that you look at 10 years ahead and, and have a pathway to uh, going towards zero, uh, and not just occasionally when some there's a lot of push trying to uh, make the code more stringent, but have a planned approach. And, and COAG has accepted that, and uh, the, the, the government's moving towards that uh, now. But there, there are others who are doing a lot of work uh, in this area, uh, including the, at city level. Sydney City released last week uh, a set of standards which are best practice uh, in Australia uh, at the moment, setting targets like for commercial buildings uh, in the order of 45 kilowatt uh, hours per meter squared per annum type numbers uh, for a base building that you need to achieve if you are going to hit zero zero carbon before 2030. So in the presence of those types of numbers, you can actually navigate uh, a bit better, and there are tools that support you navigating that. We have looked at, uh, in the publications and work we are doing, uh, a much more life cycle approach, uh, where, where we're looking at embedded carbon. It's an area which has been... Uh, uh, not regarded seriously. A lot of talk has happened, but embodied carbon uh, has not been part of many of the tools uh, and, 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 and uh, codes and standards uh, that drive the reduction of carbon in buildings. Uh, so we are trying to pull together. There's a lot of data, but there are disparate bits of data all over the place, and that has been a reason why there hasn't been consensus on the tool nor the data that underpins that. Uh, so what what we are trying to do is look at, and, and my colleague uh, Phil will talk about that in much more detail, uh, but we, we have a life cycle perspective on that. Operational energy has been looked at, so when they talk about zero carbon uh, Barangaroo uh, precinct, uh, they, they, they achieve it through a lot of offsets from, from uh, outside the site, uh, which is okay, better than doing nothing, uh, but uh, it, it, there is a lot to be done on site, and, and, and how do you improve on site 
and uh, coupled with uh, outsourcing uh, deliver on that. So, so on that front, energy efficiency on site, most organizations like Green Building Councils, etc., uh, have this view that there should be a high levels of energy efficiency first, and then on site renewables, and then uh, you look at uh, out, uh, outsourcing. And the balance therein is between the client and, and the developer and, and, and the professionals to achieve because some things that may be slightly more expensive today, you can get much cheaper offsets uh, done uh, the, uh, these days. Uh, my university, New South Wales, uh, has gone to 100% off-site solar. We tried uh, with on-site, uh, didn't go very far because of limitations. Efficiencies in existing buildings could not move very far because of cost parameters. The cheapest option uh, and the most economic was photovoltaic uh, off-site uh, to, to do 100% offset. We, obviously, we have a huge center like uh, ANU here also has uh, in photovoltaic research, so we wanted it from photovoltaics and not just wind. Uh, but uh, as, as you see in the, in, the, in, the, in the diagram here, we generate so much more during the day that offsets the night time uh, when, when, when there is no sun. But it was done via a power purchasing agreement which made it the cheapest option over a 15-year period. It wasn't just because of green reasons. It was the cheapest option over a 15-year period contract that we signed. So it, it's, it's there today. Uh, and, and either small scale or large scale, you can get that done uh, through various mechanisms. Uh, there are, I mentioned uh, other countries, uh, the Royal Institute of British Architects and uh, the American uh, uh, counterparts and, and, and so forth. They have got their own targets uh, set. Uh, in terms of w how and what to achieve. There's a consistency in method uh, in those. And we, coming from the university system and uh, looking at uh, good science, good measurability, and good reporting uh, as, as essential elements of that to make it credible. Uh, so the Paris proof method, as it's called, which came, came out of the, the Dutch uh, Green Building Council. Uh, and uh, they looked at a boundary condition in a top-down approach to looking at carbon economy-wide and then separating the building sector and then break it down into different building typologies. And I'll talk a bit more about that. But that seemed like uh, a method that's consistent uh, across a number of countries uh, at, uh, as well as uh, uh, sort of looking at it from a top-down perspective. So economy-wide buildings and different building types and what would be the attributed uh, carbon from that point of view. However, when, when an architect's designing uh, a building, it's much more bottom-up. Uh, so, so you're looking at heating, cooling, facade, and all those choices that you make so that how you can uh, target certain uh, best practice goals within all of those to be able to deliver a very efficient building and then go and look at uh, renewables uh, as options. So our method looks at both a, a combination of top-down our meaning the method we are using as opposed to the Paris proof only, uh, which is uh, the European uh, method largely, uh, the top down, but marrying it with the bottom up so that architects can better understand that it is achievable in terms of the decision uh, types that they have. Uh, this is just from the World Green Building Council, and, and they define a net zero carbon building, uh, which is highly energy efficient with all remaining energy from on-site or off-site renewables. So, so it's pretty simple from that point of view. But uh, measurability and disclosure of carbon is, is an important part of that, uh, and, and verification and, and, and the rigor that goes with it. So we feel that we have this whole campaign and movement has been around globally for long enough, and we want to now move into much more measurable uh, and, and exactly how to deliver on those uh, stage, if you like, as opposed to just aspirationally talking about things which we all now agree on anyway. So we, we looked at the Paris proof method with Australian data 
and and for commercial buildings looked at uh, uh, energy use intensity and trying to see what uh, realistic achievable uh, goals can be for heating ventilating and air conditioning equipments and shading and so forth and 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 and, and marked out how you could uh, achieve a path to zero this is much more detail in terms of our publication and so forth uh, but this is just a, a, a way of capturing that uh, information in residential we have done similarly uh, amazingly amazingly enough there's a lot of data on commercial we find we thought it was going to be the other way around but not as much publishable accessible data on residential uh, even though residential efficiencies have been sort of implemented for much longer period of time and also embedded uh, carbon. Uh, we, we sort of uh, averaging at three star base building these days. We are looking at how you can go towards five star and, and, and Phil will talk about it much more detail but you can reduce it by various mechanisms and plot a pathway for offsetting that. So you're not just offsetting uh, uh, the operational carbon over its life there is embedded carbon that you need to uh, reduce uh, over, over whatever period you might agree on. And that's why embedded, sometimes they say you might go to 2040 for embedded, but much sooner for others. So to simplify things for people who just don't have time, we are developing communication tools uh, and infographics that allows you to navigate better. Uh, setting goals and targets at, at each point uh, to see if by 2030 we can hit net zero uh, operational for sure. Many companies are now going well ahead of that. Uh, Coles and Woolworths and others are now beginning to get into uh, upping each other. Uh, they, they, uh, Woolworths went to 2025, they want to go to net zero. Coles came uh, six months later and said they want 2024. Obviously, they, they, that's what we need to get going within large businesses to be, to be able to uh, actually achieve those sorts of goals. So uh, as we publicize the information on what you can do and how cost effective a lot of these are, uh, we hope that uh, it would fast track the uptake. Uh, there are lots of tools available, both for operational and embedded carbon. Uh, my, my center itself has done one called Integrated Carbon Metrics Tool, which comes out of huge amounts of data that we collected uh, on, on uh, the, the carbon inventory, if you like, of materials and so forth. So you can look at building scale or you can look at a whole urban precinct scale. The, the diagram on the top right there uh, is Adelaide City, and we did a carbon mapping for Adelaide City, uh, looking at their zero carbon plans uh, into the future, uh, and what using scope one, scope two, and three uh, methodologies, uh, how soon can they realistically uh, deliver a zero carbon Adelaide, which is for the central part, the city part. It, it's such a good experimental site because it's just a whole bunch of buildings and transport, whatever, surrounded by uh, parks. So, so it's, there's a very distinct boundary from an experimental point of view. Uh, so there's a lot more support information. The, the center, I talk about CRC for low carbon living, uh, has guidelines for most building categories to drive towards low carbon. And this is freely accessible to, to anyone, uh, particularly students, uh, tertiary students, I would say, uh, are wide consumers of these uh, because it comes in a handy guide form that allows you to uh, navigate how to, how to achieve uh, zero carbon. We are putting together in the book uh, world-class exemplars, these are not just the uh, ones, these just we picked it for the slides, but we, we're looking at buildings that claim zero carbon, net carbon uh, globally uh, and saying, okay, what did they achieve, how did they achieve it, where did they pass or fail, uh, and, and, and finding where, where, whether their measurability and all of those things seem to be uh, close enough. So, so that would give uh, designers further information uh, on, on uh, how to measure. The book's out in, uh, well, May actually, uh, and, and, and uh, April the guide should be out. The guide would be freely available, and the book is with uh, Macmillan's. So 
Thank you. Thank you so much, Deo. We'll please um, join us again for the questions at the end of the at the end of the presentations. That was such a. a a resonant talk for our project um, and uh, revisited a number of the themes that came up in our first seminar and, and particularly what struck me was the way in which um, your project, Deo, has uh, worked on delivering these fine-grained tools that are needed in complex, different complex human environments as well as um, natural environments to meet these aspirational goals that that we're, we're setting. And also something that um, Susan MacDonald, um, the head of conservation at the Getty Institute, mentioned in our first symposium, which was the leading role that um, businesses are taking in, in the, these actions, sometimes in the absence of government direction, and also the rise of what she called fourth sector um, organisations, so for-profit um, uh, businesses, but uh, with social objectives, or, or objectives towards social good. So thank you so much, Deo. I'm sure we'll have lots of um, questions pinging in through the email on, on that wonderful presentation. So our next speaker this afternoon is Philip Oldfield, and Philip is Head of School of the Built Environment at the University of New South Wales. Thank you for coming down and joining us, Philip. And Philip will talk on Beyond Operations, the importance of embodied carbon in the built environment and how we can reduce this. So thanks, Philip. Thank you very much and, and thanks so much for inviting me to such a wonderful event and, and building. So I will be talking about Beyond Operations and I'll be expanding our understanding, picking upon um, what Deo said before about whole life cycle thinking buildings and in particular the importance, importance of our materials and what contribution they make to carbon emissions and environmental degradation and factors we can use to reduce this. So from my perspective, I think there's two major challenges we face in the built environment, and they're contradictory challenges. The first is we know we have to radically and rapidly reduce carbon emissions, and I think Deo has summed that up remarkably elo eloquently. This is a diagram of global energy-related carbon emissions, and as you can see, about 39% are related to the built environment. 11% related to the construction industry, i.e. the building of our buildings, 17% for residential buildings, and 11% for non-residential. So we know we need to reduce this. That's part one. But at the same time, we also know our built environment is getting bigger. It's getting bigger at the most you know, kind of rapid rate. We are experiencing the most significant global construction boom ever. 193,107 people move to our urban centres every day, 1.4 million people a week. Where will these people live? Where will they work? Where will they play? Um, in buildings. And the resultant buildings we need are quite significant. So if you look at total global residential building stock in 2010, it was 141 billion square metres, that will double by 2050 to 274 billion square metres. Um, and that's the equivalent of half a million Empire State Buildings or half a billion detached houses. That's going to need a lot of concrete, a lot of bricks, a lot of steel. And you know, some of that building is, is willful, it's un unnecessary, people want bigger homes. Um, pool rooms and uh, games rooms and snooker rooms and stuff, understandably. But also many millions of people live in housing poverty or energy poverty and there's a very, very real need to improve our global building stock. And this is not just a global challenge, it's a very, very local challenge. According to ASBEC, 51% of buildings in Australia standing in 2050 will be new as of last year. So everywhere you go, technically, there'll be a kind of doubling of buildings. 
How are we going to do this in a sustainable, uh, equitable uh, manner? So we have these kind of contradictory things happening. We need to radically reduce our carbon emissions, while we need, need to essentially double our global building stock. And for me, that is the architectural built environment challenge of the 21st century. We also know our buildings are having a quite monumental impact on the environment. This is just out of nature um, last year, quite remarkable study. Um, 2020 was a, a turnover point where man-made stuff weighed more than biological stuff for the first time ever. Uh, man-made things weighed more than biomass. So our global buildings and infrastructure weighs more than all the trees and shrubs in the world. So we, we ha are having a bigger impact than nature. Um, we are, I mean, our addiction to concrete is well known. As a human race, we use water first and concrete second. So, uh, you know, and the carbon emissions from cement, the main ingredient of concrete, are 7% of anthropogenic CO2 emissions. So again, we know the buildings are having a significant impact. And historically, when we think about buildings and sustainability, we thought about energy efficiency. So we thought about reducing the operational emissions of buildings. Um, this is the life cycle of a building. And if you think about a building, it will have an environmental impact in many different stages, from the extraction of the iron ore that goes to make the steel beams, down to the transportation of those beams to a, to a, a site, the construction of those, uh, replacement of materials over a building's lifetime, and eventually, 50, 100 years down the line, the demolition of that building and the recycling of those materials all those processes contribute to environmental impacts. Historically, we've not really looked at this. We've looked at the yellow block. We've looked at heating, cooling, ventilation, lighting. It's only really in the past 10 to 15 years we've started to look at life cycle thinking in buildings. And there's, there's two ways, when we think about carbon emissions of buildings, there's two main categories of emissions. There's what we call embodied carbon, uh, it's sometimes called upfront carbon. I don't call it upfront carbon because it's not all upfront, but it's, it's the extraction of the raw materials, the processing of those materials, the assembly of the building. So it's the emissions to make the building in the first place, but also to retrofit the building over its life and then to disassemble a building at the end of its life. And then you've got the operational side of things, the, and that is the emissions start the second you, you turn the key into the door, you put the lights on, that, you know, it's the lighting, the heating, the cooling. You add those two together and you get the life cycle carbon emissions. And historically, our understanding was around the idea that 80% of a building's carbon emissions were operational. So the vast majority of a building's impact on the lighting, heating, cooling side of things. More recent thinking shows that's not strictly true, and it's much closer to a 60-40 split. But even more recent thinking suggests it depends on a huge amount of factors. One of the predominant factors is how quickly we decarbonize our energy grid. So um, hopefully we are going through the process where we are going to be reducing the amount of dirty coal-fired power plants and you know, switching to renewable energy. When we do that, the ratio of embodied to operational changes. This is a study we, we recently completed with a, with a DOCRC for low carbon living where we looked at a, a multi-story building in Sydney and we measured its embodied and operational carbon emissions and we compared it with current electricity and our future electricity, a future decarbonized electricity grid. And we showed that the, the impact of embodied carbon becomes quite significant, massive in fact, the second we start decarbonizing um, the grid because most of the emissions are tied into those materials rather than the heating, the cooling, and the ventilation of the building. I should say as well, look, so we, we suggested that actually in the building, uh, the embodied carbon was close to 58%. It's probably higher because we didn't count all the mechanical equipment as well. So we didn't count all the aluminium that goes into the, uh, all the copper piping, all the plumbing, because that can be quite hard to uh, quantify as well. So hopefully I've established how important 
and body carbon is. Let's look at some ways to reduce it. Um, the World Rebuilding Council has called on designers and nations to radically reduce some body carbon, and they have talked about four different ways. Build nothing, build less, build clever, and build efficiently. The first of those is build nothing. So you have guaranteed to have a zero and body carbon building if you've just got a nice lovely field. Uh, if you don't build the building, you save all the embodied carbon. Now, it might seem quite glib, but it's actually a very real um, strategy. If we think our current demands on future building are to, to construct the equivalent of every building in Japan every year, is that all necessary? Well, some definitely is necessary, but is that level of construction necessary? Um, can we make better use of what we've got? This is a social, political uh, issue rather than a technological issue. For example, I saw this article a couple of years ago, one million empty homes across Australia. Now, those homes are empty for a number of reasons. Um, some may have been abandoned, some are being demolished, some have just been constructed. Um, but effectively, there's my a uh, little bit of science underneath there. Um, if you take a million homes, you take the average floor area of 230 metres squared, you add a typical embodied carbon figure and you've got 138 million tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent embodied in those homes. That's a quarter of Australia's national emissions in total. We've potentially nobody using that. So we need to make better use of what we've got in the first place. And, and look, there are examples of this. So the Olympics has historically been a very good opportunity to build lots of buildings. But increasingly, I think Los Angeles in 2028, Paris in 2024, will not be creating too many new buildings and, and using their existing building stock. It's a much smarter way of doing things. Secondly, we can build less. Uh, and by that, I mean we can adaptively reuse what we've got, make take advantage of what we've got already, which is why we're here, which is what we're kind of talking about. And I think Caroline will touch on this in much greater detail than I will. Um, but it would be um, limiting of me to not point out that the most recently awarded Pritzker Prize winners, uh, Lacton and, uh, and Vazel, um, have made their names doing very precise and uh, sympathetic and sensitive adaptive reuse of, of public social housing in France, turning buildings that were unloved into, into really elegant, beautiful, livable architecture as well. And their mantra, never demolish, never remove, always add, transform and reuse, could become the start of a new set of values in architecture. But also, look, there's examples um, much closer to home, one quite close to me, which is a refurbishment of the AMP building into the, the QQN. So you can see 1976 AMP tower, um, pretty much un, um, the floor plates aren't really efficient anymore, so rather than knock this building down, a series of partial demolitions and expansions are undertaken. The front of the building is removed, two-thirds of the building, tens of thousands of tons of concrete and steel are retained, and the building is extended, giving it another lease of life for 50 or so years. We can also build clever. Now, you'll note as we get further down the line, the savings are less and less and less. So obviously building nothing is our, um, is our best option, but we can't always build nothing. As I said before, we do have to build. The best analogy I can give here is one of a, of a broken bone. If we break a bone, we might put a cast on that bone. We're not worried about the amount of material in that cast. We just want to heal the bone. But through technologies and through different ways of thinking, do we need all that material to help heal the bone? Can we optimize what we need? You know, can we use less in a better way? That is about building clever. Um, this is an example. Um, this is a super tall tower in uh, Shanghai. I won't bore you all with uh, the unsustainability of super tall buildings, but um, I like to give this as an analogy of um, some of our concerns around greenwashing and around the importance of embodied carbon. So the building twists 120 degrees. Why it does that is to reduce the wind pressure on the building. And doing that reduced 20,000 tons of steel from the megastructure in the building. That saved $58 million. You've got a very happy client. 
but it also reduced 20,000 tons of steel, which has an embodied carbon of about 43,000 tons of uh, carbon emissions. The building also has lots of little wind turbines at the top that spin around. Um, they're on, they get in the media a lot. People talk about this building being a green building because of the wind turbines. But effectively, those wind turbines would have to turn for 358 years to offset the same amount of carbon as reducing the steel from the body of the building. So when we make changes, smart changes to buildings, when we reduce materials, the savings can be very significant, far more significant than eco-bling on the top of buildings. We can also reuse and recycle in much more innovative ways. This is a beautiful public house in uh, Kamikans in Japan. The local prefecture have decided to go 100% waste free. So the architects here recycled um, a variety of different windows from abandoned houses to create a double skin facade for this beautiful public house. And finally, something I'm, I'm really interested in is timber, mass timber as a solution um, to uh, reducing our embodied carbon emissions. So uh, many of you know this is, this is International House in Sydney and timber has been heralded as a potential solution to um, reducing the embodied carbon of, of buildings. So rather than using concrete, we can use uh, a biological uh, material. Effectively, where do we get materials from? Well, we either mine them or we grow them. So why can't we grow our future cities? One of the benefits of timber is the carbon cycle of, the natural carbon cycle of trees. So tre as trees grow in forests, they um, photosynthesize, they absorb CO2 and release oxygen. You, that's called sequestration. You can um, consider that carbon benefit to the building so long as that tree is grown in a sustainable way, i.e. for every tree cut down a new tree is grown. And that allows potential carbon benefits to buildings that are built out of mass timber. Another study we did with the, the CRC for Low Carbon Living alongside DEA was to examine the embodied carbon impact of buildings built out of different materials. Um, our base building was 18 storeys with a five-storey concrete basement, so lots of car parking, uh, residential building in the, in the city of Sydney. And what you see there is a series of, of uh, bar charts, each one the embodied carbon of the building built using different materials. So you've got your base building on the left-hand side, which was about 750 kilograms of CO2 per metre squared. Uh, we used a flat slab building, that saved 6%. Post-tension slab saved 8%. Steel deck didn't save much, really. The, the two, the two um, bar charts that are the lowest are the timber um, are the timber structures, one using a CLT floor and one using a whole timber um, kind of structure. You'll see they also have a purple part, which none of the other buildings do, which none of the other bar charts do. That's because we also measured the end of life of timber. So if you think about a tree, it has a carbon benefit at the beginning of its life, but when that timber is disposed of at the end of a life, it releases all that carbon dioxide, often as methane, into the environment. And, and so that's something really important to consider is, is that we found that, look, timber buildings can save a huge amount of carbon dioxide, but it's the end of life that's really important. And you've got to think about concrete and timber quite differently. This is a very recent study from Sustainable Production and Consumption. The yellow line is concrete, the embodied carbon of concrete over its life. When you create concrete, you, you heat up limestone, to create clinker in a big rotating furnace. Um, when you do that, it breaks down the, the kind of bonds and that releases carbon dioxide. So you've got the energy needed to heat the limestone and you've got the release of carbon dioxide as well. So there's a big uh, increase in carbon dioxide. But if that concrete is exposed over its life, it will also absorb ever so slightly a little bit of carbon dioxide, so it reduces a little bit, and at the end of its life, you then tend to dispose of it, and so you've got a little bit of increase in trans transporting that concrete. Timber, on the other hand, you have a big benefit at the beginning of its life, so it starts to sequest carbon when it's growing as a tree, so the, the tree's absorbing carbon. Um, so timber starts off negative at the raw material level. 
uh, through production and consumption. So you've got to saw the timber, you've got to glue it together, you've got to fabricate it. That does take carbon emissions, so it reduces a little bit. But it's the end of life that's really important. We've got to be thinking now, we're building these timber buildings. Um, effectively, what we're doing is kicking a carbon can down the road a little bit. We are... It, Timber does not necessarily reduce carbon emissions. It is a long-term carbon storage system. And that is very, very different. So we have got to think about extending the life of these buildings, how we might recycle and reuse these components at the end of their life. Because if you just burn the timber at the end of its life, or if you just uh, send it to landfill, you are going to be releasing all the benefit um, that is locked up in that material back into the atmosphere in 50 or 100 years' time. It's also important to touch on what is, is carbon neutral. We talk about carbon neutral a, a whole amount, and there is a consideration that carbon neutrality is, is the utmost desire for our built environment. But let's just pause and think about what is the definition in Australian standards of carbon neutral. A carbon neutral building built today is one um, that is uh, net zero carbon in operation. The definition of carbon neutral does not consider embodied carbon in Australian, um, the Australian definition at this time. So it only considers everything inside that red circle. So if you see a, a marketing for carbon neutral building, it could be built out of titanium or any high precious metal. The emissions related to that would not count. So we are at this point where we're trying to expand our definition to consider the whole life cycle of a building. So in Norway, they have, I think, six different definitions of net zero carbon, which um, go from the yellow bit, to the yellow and bit of the blue, a yellow, a bit of the blue, and a bit of the green, and the whole thing as well. So that's where we're moving towards, and that's what we need to consider, because as I say, buildings have this impact on the environment across their life cycle, from many years before the building's built to many, many years afterwards as well. So I want to finish with a bit of a project um, we've recently completed. It was a collaboration between UNSW Built Environment and UNSW Engineering, led by uh, Dr. Cameron Allen uh, and supported by the DGFI. We wanted to know, um, could we get all Australia's buildings down to a uh, whole life cycle net zero? Um, and so we built a model, a stock and flow model, of the entire building stock of Australia um, using some assumptions, some pretty big assumptions, and we generated three different scenarios, a business as usual scenario, um, scenario one, which we reduced population growth, uh, reduced migration, so we built less buildings, uh, lower demand for fossil fuels, sort of top-down model, so we didn't look at each individual building, we looked at the system. 90% electric cars by 2050, increased energy efficiency investment. We assumed 70 to 80% of buildings would be electric by 2050, and there'd be a radical increase in investment in renewables. That's a dotted blue line. And scenario two, um, we added 30% timber buildings as well. So we started adding in a huge amount of mass timber buildings. So what you see there is the annual greenhouse gas emissions in materials. This is embodied carbon. And we got down to zero embodied carbon by 2042 this way. And effectively what's happening there is in radical increases of renewable energy are reducing the embodied, co uh, embodied carbon coefficients of materials. So that's making it really low. And the timber buildings are offsetting the remaining carbon emissions. And those, timber emission, those emissions will come back at the end of those tim timber buildings' life, but not within those 50 years. And effectively, once you add in the operational emissions as well, we managed to get down to a 94% reduction in business as usual, whole life cycle operational and embodied carbon emissions. So it is possible. And, and look, there, there were limitations to this study. We only considered six main materials. Uh, we only considered the concrete, steel, uh, copper, timber plasterboard and one other, which I will forget. Um, and there's other limitations to it as well, but it shows that policy that's not too outside of our, you know, what we currently think, radical 
um, switch to renewable energy, electrification of buildings, use of timber buildings, reducing our um, reducing the number of buildings we built where at all possible, and uh, reducing the embodied carbon in different materials would make this possible. So this 2050 target is possible. So let's do it. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much, Philip. So many um, spectacular examples in in your presentation there, and um, I was just blown away by that statistic about how, for the first time, the entire biomass on the planet is outweighed by, I think you said, man-made materials. And I was going to pull you up on that and say human-made materials, but I think I'm quite happy with leaving the responsibility for that statistic with men. <laughs> and that does make me think about the, the gendered dimensions um, of sustainability, and I think that's quite a good segue into our next speaker's um, proposed topic. And so my next task is to introduce Caroline Pidcock, who once again has travelled here from Sydney. Um, and Caroline is a leading architect and advocate um, of sustainable design and of building a culturally rich, socially just and ecologically restorative future. And the title of Caroline's talk is Tend, Mend, Renew, Regenerate. Hello everyone, what a pleasure to be here and so lovely to see some great friends here as well. Firstly, I'd like to start by acknowledging and paying respect to the traditional custodians across this whole land and particularly those of the land on which we meet, the Ngunnawal people and which is their ancestral lands that Canberra University is built on. Um, as we share our knowledge and learning, may we also pay respect to the knowledge and traditions of these peoples. I was born in Grafton on the mighty Clarence River in the land of the Gumbungya Nation, currently under flood, and grew up in Sydney in the land of the Eora Nation. I have been shaped by their amazing water systems and, and um, continue to be nurtured by them. I'm in awe of our First Nations ways of knowing, being and doing and believe they have so much to offer how we shape our future. As Elizabeth Lesser notes in her fabulous book, Cassandra Speaks, when women are the storytellers, the human story changes, rather than fight or flight, women are much more likely to tend and befriend. Similarly, I take note from a colleague's recent fa Facebook page where she was talking about a recent article club she participated in, bite-sized readings rather than a book. She offered four pieces of advice and the most provocative of, of all was stop thinking like a capitalist and start thinking like a mother. A mother knows that money is an important part of managing the household but not the purpose of managing the household. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women have a concept for this, rematriation, a reclamation of the feminine, of the sacred mother. In case anyone has forgotten, we have been living through the very obvious symptoms of a system undergoing great damage from climate change. The summer, just even over a year ago, was particularly horrific for many Australians, preceded by a terrible drought. We then had bushfires across the land, even in places like rainforests which shouldn't burn. We had hailstorms, dust storms, flooding, mass deaths of wildlife in the rivers, the reefs and the fires. We had Black Lives Matters protests, and then we had the pandemic. And now, more flooding. And finally, we are facing up to the inequality endured by women in Australia and the shameful danger they face in their daily lives. As Audre Lorde, a black lesbian mother warrior poet notes, there is no such thing as a single issue struggle because we do not live single issue lives. As we who are interested and involved in the built environment address this mass of concurrent crises, perhaps we too could adopt some more feminine approaches to how we work. But first, a story from Michael Pollan and Sarah Ichioka about a misunderstood system. 
In the 1950s, the World Health Organization strove to bring malaria under control in Borneo by using DDT to kill mosquitoes. The initial results were positive and rates of malarial infection went down. What the WHO had not anticipated was the DDT also would kill the wasps that predated on the caterpillars that were inclined to eat the way through the thatched roofs and people's dwellings. The caterpillars ran amok and, um, and ate their way through all their houses and who had to pay for people's houses, roofs to be replaced with corrugated steel, which transmitted unbearable heat in the summer and deafening noise in the rainy season. The chain of unexpected consequences continued as DDT bioaccumulated up the food chain of geckos and then fatally to the cats that had previously kept the rat population under control. A cropful, a, a, a apocryphal accounts further described how fearing an outbreak of bubonic plague as the rodent numbers grew exponentially, the WHO parachuted thousands of live cats into Borneo. It's important to understand the systems you are working with in, not just the isolated problem before you. So, what to do? Um, in Architects Declare was formed by Michael Porn and Steve Tompkins after they read the 2019 IPCC report that stated we have less than a decade to turn things around if we want to keep temperature increases below 1.5 degrees and give hope to the human race being able to continue, a reasonably important aim. They also reread Donna Meadows' essay called Leverage Points um, on the importance of mindsets in making change. And out of this came Construction Declare and Architects Declare, of which Architects Declare is a subset. A number of us in Australia decided that we should do the same, and Australian Architects Declare was launched in 2019, July 2019, and I'm the spokesperson for the movement. The vision we have developed for Australia was to empower architects to take responsibility and act in a way that architecture is a catalyst for healing and regeneration, so that we joyfully live in resilient and co-evolving ecosystems. So what does that look like? Currently we have 113 signatories representing thousands of architects. We are developing, promoting tools and amassing research for easy access to actually help everyone deliver on the promises and Dao and, um, and Phil's work is contributing to that. The urgency of this work can't be underestimated. Published um, on the 13th of January 2021 was an article in Frontiers of conservation science called Underestimating the Challenges of Avoiding a Ghastly Future. The article's message was simple, everything must change. Humanity, or some of us anyway, is running an ecological Ponzi scheme in which society, or some sections of it, robs nature and future generations to pay for boosting incomes in the short term. Only a radical transformation of the systems that govern our relations to one another and to the myriad forms of life with which we share the planet, the authors concurred, could deliver any hope of a less ravaged future. I've been thinking a lot about what this means for me. What should I be doing myself? How should I be changing my mindset? And how does it impact our profession of architecture? With Elizabeth Lesser's ideas about tend and befriend in mind, and the inspiration of the 2021 Pritzker Prize winners, Anne Lacaton, Jean-Philippe Jean Vassal, who uh, Phil mentioned, who work with kindness and apply a credo, never demolish, never remove or replace, always add, transform and refuse and reuse. I've developed some ideas about how we could work. I suggest we could do well to tend, mend, renew and regenerate. To illustrate how this might apply to a real world situation, I'll apply these ideas to a case study at Miller's Point where I live. The suburb, which is located next to the rocks at the northern tip of Sydney CBD, is state heritage listed. And in its statement of significant, 
the, the, it notes, um, the Millers Point Heritage Conservation Area is a substantially intact residential and commercial precinct of outstanding state and national significance. The natural rocky terrain, despite much alteration, remains the dominant physical element in this significant urban cultural landscape in which land and water, nature and culture are intimately connected historically, socially, visually and functionally. It has evolved in response to both the physical characteristics of its peninsula location and to the broader historical patterns and processes that have shaped the development of New South Wales since the 1780s. The whole place remains a living cultural landscape, greatly valued by both its local residents and the people of New South Wales. The value of the area is further enhanced by its separation from the Rocks Precinct, which is predominantly commercial in use, with Millers Point retaining its residential character, in particular worker housing. This is a rare continuing use. In 2008, the Labor government the state Labor government recognised it was not honouring its own heritage requirements and was conflicted in how it could do so. The requirements of the housing tenants were not necessarily aligned with the building's heritage. They owned the whole block, the whole land, which they compulsorily require, acquired in, in 1900 when there was a plague. They decided to prepare conservation um, management plans for the buildings as they became available, people moved out, and sell them under 99-year leases with strict covenants and bonds requiring they be affixed in accordance with the CMPs within two years. In 2014, when the Liberal um, state government ca came into power, they decided that all the building stock should be sold and the entire housing community moved on. Their neoliberal abhorrence for governing, which Elizabeth Farrelly explores in her recent book, Killing Sydney, is quite out of kilter with the re real need for government leadership at this time. Many residents, old and new, spent years unsuccessfully striving to have the entire significance of the area addressed, this special place and its people, not just the buildings. Alas, only the physical aspects of the buildings have been retained to some degree, with the loss of the community who significantly contributed to the rare continuing use and nearly all the affordable housing for workers sold off. Most egregious was the sale of the Sirius building, which had been built to house community evicted from the rocks in the 70s developer boom. The green bands on which the area, thank you Jack Mundy and friends, were lifted when Sirius was agreed to be built and with a promise for indefinite use for its inhabitants. The developer who won the tender for the building aims to keep the majority of the building structure, which is great. However, they're going to gentrify it to reflect the desires of the potential purchasers and there will be no affordable housing included, the most, I think, the most significant part of its heritage. So how to tend, mend and renew in Miller's Point? Tend is to apply one's attention, attend, to take care of, minister to, watch over, look after, attend to. Oops, sorry. Um, so first up, oh no, that's right. First up, before we do anything, we need to develop the deepest possible understanding of the systems the project is based within, the social, cultural, physical and ecological systems and their intersections. This will enable us to discern what is existing, what is important and what potential is available to be realised. In Miller's point, this would have pointed to the importance not only of the building stock, but also the significant urban cultural landscape in which land and water, nature and culture are intimately connected, historically, socially, visually and functionally. Clearly the buildings were not being adequately cared for and there were some social problems evident. Both needed to be tended to. So too the natural environment. So much research in this area has already been done in Miller's Point. A coalescence of this information could have been used to develop a really comprehensive analysis of the place and how it sits within the nested systems of Sydney, the land of the Eora Nation and Australia. And they should have been drawn up with significant local input for a from a local Aboriginal elders with an aim to understand how best to move, evolve this place forward. Additionally, 
a responsive time frame for this thinking and ongoing work should have been developed and implemented. One that understands both the long-term thinking and impacts along with the urgency of the current situation. One that builds trust, encourages and values the involvement of Aboriginal elders and the wider community who contribute in their spare time. Mend. To repair something broken or torn or worn, restore to good condition, make whole, fix, to make better, improve, reform, set right. Once we have a deep understanding of what is important, we can work out how we can contribute to making appropriate improvements at the many levels of the system before we consider anything else. We need to move beyond the first instincts to either try to remake as perfect or knock down and start again. The Japanese art of kintsugi is about putting old broken pottery pieces back together with gold, built on the idea that embracing flaws and imperfections you can create an even stronger, more beautiful piece of art, an excellent idea for the built environment. In Miller's point, a kintsugi approach to mending could have involved improving the social and cultural diversity of the area working with the local housing community to address the many social and financial issues they, f they face and help them into key work in the city, keeping all the housing built for workers and mending them with effective maintenance, which hadn't been happening, and much to improve natural comfort levels, selling the older, larger homes to people who had the interest and financial ability to repair and upgrade the houses in according with the CMPs. That bit did happen, but they also sold all the workers' housing. Renew is to make new or as if new again restore, to bring into being again, re-establish. After mending what can and should be attended to, we need to consider how to renew the whole. This should involve identifying how a project will address and support the future in all aspects, sentient and inanimate, which are part of it. With deep work undertaken on ensuring what is really important, it is then possible to find the best pathways forward and with what can be changed and how new work can be added to what already is. The success of our work and the creation of valuable projects depends on it. While I believe strongly in heritage and the importance of learning from the past, I'm also concerned that sometimes um, that sometimes this can prevent us from doing what needs to happen for the best possible future. With, um, I agree with James Lesh and Carly Meyer's article, Stuck in the Past, Why Australian Heritage Practice Falls Short on What the Public Expects. The existing system is not responsive enough to the powerful and evolving interactions between cultural heritage, social, cultural and environmental imperatives and people and place. For instance, conservation should not be a barrier to the sustainable reuse and recycling of buildings, nor should it hinder people from shaping heritage places. Our new research on people-centred conservation proposes that the deep relationship between communities and their historic places has the potential to reshape heritage processes. An approach is needed that centralises the ever-changing issues that affect human relationships to existing places. In Miller's point, renewal could have been revealed by mandating essential future services such as PV panels, water tanks and roof gardens to be sensitively installed, along with a more consistent approach to appropriate building amendments to allow for different ways of living to when those houses were built, like we don't have servants anymore, um, comprehensively rewilding the streets with indigenous plants, food and pedestrians so we can reprioritise people to cars which would have provided a great live experiment for the rest of the city. And regenerate. Regeneration is more than fixing up a rundown area of town so you can house a few more people. Fortunately, it's so much more than this and so much more inspiring. I believe it's about deeply understanding the nested systems we exist within, finding the energies, synergies and potential to be realised in ways that all parts of the system can co-evolve and flourish into the future. With regards to Miller's point and Sirius in particular, this could have included replacing the Sirius car parks along the walkways with places for creative work, setting up systems to encourage community members to mentor and assist those in need of their skills, both from sort of people with money, without money, they've all got something to offer and teach each other, and helping them make the most of their lives while finding personal reward from such sharing. 
installing electric car share um, in the series car park for residents to make use of all around, identifying positive circular ways of dealing with our own garbage, sewerage and stormwater so they become inputs for other systems, connecting this place to community solar or wind farms so we can ensure we achieve zero carbon and em emissions as soon as possible in operation. Phil. Many other operations to create a thriving community that pulls its weight in delivering its own requirements and contributions to others. As Daniel Christian Wall, um, someone who I'm quite very inspired by, says, we need to provide leadership by aligning one's own way of being, one's actions, ways of communicating and being in relationship with the wider pattern of life's evolutionary journey towards increasing complexity and coherence within the nested wholeness of community, ecosystems, biosphere and the universe we participate in. To conclude, I'd like to relate another story from Michael Poen and Sarah Ichioka, this time about positively redressing a previously misunderstood system in Yellowstone National Park. Wolves had once been ubiquitous in North America, but in 1906 an attempt was launched to hunt them to extinction. After an absence of 70 years from Yellowstone, wolves were reintroduced in 1995 and the results were dramatic. Red deer, whose numbers were problematically high, stopped venturing into the narrower river valleys where they were more likely to be preyed on by the wolves. Trees, previously to low, grazed to low levels, grew rapidly, which created more habitat for birds as well as shading the water. With cooler water and more cover provided by tree roots, the populations of fish, insects and amphibians increased. Larger trees allowed beavers to return and build dams which provided further niches for an even wider spectrum of wildlife. Wolves also hunted coyotes which reduced predation pressure on smaller mammals which then provided more sustenance for birds of prey. Scavengers and bears benefited from the deer carcasses left by wolves. The experiment showed that the reintroduction of a single species, wolves in this case, can transform a landscape, resulting in more trees, mammals, birds, insects, and even richer soils. It's good to know that nature can mend and transform. Let's hope we can too, urgently. As Anna, Anne Lacaton and Jean-Philippe Vassal note, like in any interconnected system, being fair to the environment, being fair to humanity, is of being fair to the next generation. I wish you freedom from constraint of trying to work within existing rules that are clearly failing and need to change, the ability to embrace rematriation in your approaches, and the openness to harness your wisdom to dream and create new ways of joyful living in your resilient and co-evolving ecosystems. Thank you. Should I say? <laughs> Thank you so much, Caroline, for a beautiful talk. Um, lots of points of connection for me there. Not a, I was born in Grafton too, so... Um, and thinking of the people in Grafton right now, dealing with yet another flood with that, with that marginal landscape. But also, I, my, one of my first jobs was... Um, excavating as an archaeologist in, in the rocks. Um, moving through the detritus of another community that had, had been destroyed in the face of a plague in 1901, cycling round to our current you know, enhanced feeling of uh, risk and disaster, I think, having lived through 2020 um, and giving 2021 this, this feeling of urgency that I think all three of our speakers have referred to in, in different ways. And something that struck me so much in excavating those early colonial communities in the rocks was that there was very little evidence before 1820s that the Europeans were eating any um, native mammal species. They, they were preferring imported uh, salted beef and salted fish. And the, the reasons were obviously cultural. You know, it, it, it wasn't an environmental reason, it was a cultural reason. However, they did love the Sydney oysters. And um, in fact, they ate 
out uh, to extinction the Sydney mud oyster, which to this day has never uh, recovered. Um, and I was thinking of these things as you talked us through um, some of the ice-bound rather sad tales of um, what's happening in, in the Millers Point um, community with lots of lessons around sustainability. So I really enjoyed um, your presentation. Thank you, Caroline. So now to respond to all three of our speakers, um, I'd like to introduce my colleague from the University of Canberra, Professor Barbara Norman, who is um, Foundation Chair of Urban and Regional Planning at the University and Director of Canberra Urban and Regional Futures, and also another warrior mother, I think we can say, after Caroline's talk. <laughs> Or tiger mum, maybe. <laughs> We're all very strong, I think is the point, <laughs> and determined. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, along with my colleagues, uh, I also wish to acknowledge the, the people, the Ngunnawal people, on whose land we are meeting today, both past and present, and thank them for allowing us to have this meeting on their lands. There's five points, we've got about 10 minutes, I think, and uh, then there'll be plenty of time for, or enough time anyway, for um, a round table and Q&A. Uh, so in, uh, in that 10 minutes, I will address five points. And uh, so I'll go through those fairly quickly. Uh, excellent speeches, thank you, and very important dimensions. And the five that I picked out of those three talks are these uh, targets, so starting with very practical, uh, measurability, uh, very much from uh, Deo, strategies, uh, a number of strategies came through, and then uh, overlaid, uh, pleasingly, by gender, and then uh, budget, we didn't talk enough about that, and that's about making it all happen. And then, uh, importantly, of course, education and community. And uh, some of the examples, particularly from Carolyn, were extremely important. Uh, I am reminded, and I've mentioned today already, and it's still on my mind, and that doesn't happen very often if, for anyone who knows me, that um, uh, watching Q&A last night on ABC and Bruce Pascoe, there were some other parts that weren't so good on it, but Bruce Pascoe was on it, and really um, Bruce I find incredibly inspiring in what he has to say, and it, it comes to the point of today about heritage and uh, right at the beginning, in fact, from uh, our introduction from hands and understanding uh, thousands of years of cultural heritage. And Bruce, really, what he said at the end uh, last night was, what we really need to do is understand what kind of society we wish to be. Uh, and this isn't about money. It isn't about capitalism. It's about our values and who we are. And if we come to an understanding of that, a deep understanding of that, many of the issues that were raised today about uh, place, sustainability, heritage and culture, actually for those to work uh, successfully in the future, we really need to be coming to this deeper, much deeper understanding about who we are as a society and where we're going. So with that kind of broader frame, I'll come right back to the, the detail. So targets. It was clear from the presentation that uh, uh, industry targets are being set. There's a lot of positive stories there. Uh, sectors are progressing. Uh, some of the amazing work that's happening on uh, recycling and the circular economy that's coming through. Uh, and subnational targets. That wonderful slide, I think, that, uh, that was put together that I think could be circulated widely of uh, every state and territory setting uh, targets at, 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 at the very latest 2050. But obviously, there's a, a strong movement to move those much closer to 2030. If even less. Uh, one of the aspects I think that didn't come through so much, which I'd like to um, encourage a bit more discussion on, is adaptation. So, uh, of course, when we're dealing with carbon, we're talking about mitigation, and that always has to be the, the most important thing. 
But the fact is, as the scientists will explain very clearly today, there is lock-in already that we are dealing with. And so there will be very significant um, uh, adaptation requirements uh, uh, now and in the future. And of course, we're seeing this play out. Uh, but then, of course, human nature and culture come into that as well. And uh, uh, it won't surprise me if uh, in the not too distant future, we'll see more and more building back in those flood prone lands we've just seen uh, uh, now. And I was heartened, though, this morning by seeing a New South Wales minister actually stopping at the, today, this morning, uh, putting at least on temporary hold two large uh, urban rezonings in those areas. So at least maybe something's getting through. But clearly adaptation will be uh, critical. So uh, dealing with heat, anything that's being built, like say the Shine Dome, dealing with heat, dealing with extreme weather, dealing with hail, which we had a dramatic storm last year that uh, uh, caused probably more damage than anything. And the insurance industry actually regard the hail storms as the most expensive event that we have in this country. Uh, so uh, dealing with adaptation is absolutely critical. But measuring all this is very, very important too. And wherever I go now, people say, how do we know how we're tracking? How do we measure? And again, very much focused again on the buildings. And so I would encourage, as a response, I guess, for us to be thinking more broadly now. So I think it was only just last week for the first time in the ACT, they asked for a, in a development approval, a carbon uh, footprint uh, plan, an analysis of the carbon impact. Now, that's one thing to do, and that's fantastic to see, but of course we don't have the skills to do it. So uh, we have to work out who we're going to engage, when I say we, the collective we. I don't work for the ACT government, but the, the, um, uh, how, how are we going to have the skills to do this? A huge opportunity, of, co of course, in terms of education and training in the future. Uh, usability in terms of measurability, um, communication of science, uh, so the practitioners out there, so I teach a number of students in first year doing building construction management, uh, and they're looking for these skills right at the coalface, and they're on site. You know, and they're wearing their hard hats and they're thinking about these things. They're very inspired about these issues and they would like to do the right thing, but they haven't got the skills to do it yet. So that's something we need to really focus on. Uh, in terms of strategies, uh, we also need to be thinking across the urban, what I call the urban hierarchy. So again, we can talk about buildings, but we also need to talk about precincts, we need to talk about neighbourhoods, we need to have carbon, uh, carbon uh, plans for these uh, spatial dimensions, uh, climate resilient plans for country towns, for example. I went out to Orange only uh, three or four weeks ago, the time goes quickly, uh, brand new housing estate, all black roofs, large houses, wall to wall, no landscaping, uh, predicted to get up to 45 degrees now, um, before the recent rain only had six months of water left. No river. Now you can see a kind of calamity happening very quickly down the track there. Uh, so I think uh, we can have all these strategies, we can have all these plans, and we can have either all the measurability and know what to do. We do know what to do, in fact, but how do we make it happen? So that brings me to budget. Where's the money? There is actually a lot of money flowing through. Uh, I've been thinking about all the different grant schemes that we hear about, good and bad, at the, from the national level coming through to communities. But are they uh, actually helping us deliver a better outcome? Now, not so, such a good report card last week. It was a report by the United Nations Environment Program and Oxford University, two credible organisations coming together. It was published last week. They looked at 50 countries. It was called, How Are We Going Building Back Better? And this is about COVID response, all the money that's washing through, coming into building and construction and infrastructure. And uh, where, where do you think we might have ranked out of 50? Yes, that's right, that wonderful distinction of 50. So we came last out of the 50 countries on building back better. We came right across the, right across the axis for money, so we were right at the front, doing brilliantly, and basically you could hardly see in the green, the green element. We were right at the bottom. And so it's not a matter of our money, it's about how we're spending these funds, and we need to be channeling these funds in the right way. So that finally comes down to education. 
uh, educating not just the next generation, because actually I'm inspired by the next generation. I think they have a great thirst for knowledge in this area. But we also need to do a lot of upskilling in the industries. Uh, people I know, even like the, the uh, you know, imagine the chief engineer in a country town, probably graduated 30 years ago, uh, hasn't had the advantage, it's not a criticism, hasn't had any, any uh, upskilling in that role, possibly trying to do the best thing, but actually has no idea how to do it. Probably has no money to engage a consultant, especially in a country town context. So I mention these things because in this country, our population was discussed in a couple of talks. We will be growing from around 25 million to 40 million by 2050. Long time to get to 25 million, very short time to get to uh, uh, another uh, 15 million uh, 20 by 2050. Very big change in this, in, this, uh, in this country in accommodating that population. I welcome growth. I welcome migration. I welcome these are bigger, bigger issues. Uh, this is what made this country, but it's how we do it and how we implement uh, the, uh, these uh, strategies that, again, come back to. So just to conclude, because I want to keep time for Q&A and the round table, uh, we know what we want to do. Uh, the big question is, how do we make this mainstream? How do we make it happen? And I have to say increasingly, and I hear, you'll hear me say it too, we need to, and this is like a, uh, something not to be said in the last few years, we need to legislate. We actually need to mandate some of these things. Guidelines will not cut it. And uh, so um, there's a bit of a provocative start to the Q&A and the round table. And I think that uh, just to finish uh, this uh, life, cycle, life cycle approach that uh, has been spoken about a lot uh, in different ways, but just to finish with Carolyn's tend, mend, renew and regenerate. Uh, I thought it was a brilliant way of summarising that in a very, uh, with, al with almost the gender overlay. It's like life cycle, but, but from uh, uh, a, gender, a female gender perspective. And uh, isn't that a great thing after the last two weeks we've had? So thank you for listening. And now I think I, I'll uh, welcome uh, quite, uh, a round table back up to here. So please, if the speakers would like, like to join me up here. Thank you very much. So I think we have about uh, just under half an hour, uh, and Tracy has come to join me, who's of course, uh, uh, I, well you've been up here Tracy, so the audience knows who you are, but uh, I also really wanted to say uh, congratulations and thank you to Tracy for, for organising all this today and to leading this, for leading this project. Um, so I'll try and do a bit of convening the round table and then uh, Tracy and I with the, uh, our external audience online will be uh, coordinating the questions coming in. So please send your questions in uh, from uh, either here or um, outside and so we can have a good discussion. So I think I might just start with a really sort of basic question to the panel. Um, what are the barriers to make this happen uh, now and in the future? As, as the three of you have uh, really uh, spoken very, um, uh, uh, in a very informed way uh, about um, uh, all the technical details, the strategies, the, the uh, considerations, why isn't it happening faster in this country? Dale, maybe start, just go across from my right. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I think you ended your talk, Barbara, with, with uh, the need for government uh, intervention, uh, trying to get uh, beyond guidelines and, and some serious policies and, and, uh, and building codes and things like that in place. Uh, th there lies one of the barriers, I guess. The community is being informed, uh, but I think there needs to be a push uh, that really mainstreams it. There is a lot of evidence that it works. Uh, photovoltaics uh, on rooftops. Uh, when, when the government incentives came in, feed-in tariffs came in, uh, it started, uh, you could see the number of roofs that were getting photovoltaics on, on, on them. Uh, and then suddenly uh, all the money dried out, no feed-in tariff, but the, the, um, the uptake rate hasn't gone down. 
uh, and and there's a couple of million uh, rooftop uh, homes with rooftops now, and very soon to be close to three million now. So so it shows that other factors do kick in, but you, for a period you do need to have the government uh, really uh, push this. Uh, governments generally use building codes as a as a mechanism uh, within our area, but uh, that, that's simply to eliminate worst practice as opposed to push best practice. So, so we need to get the new modern way of looking at codes which drive best practice, and that's a challenge for government. Thank you. And uh, Karen? I think um, that we need to do it both ways. I think, I think regulation stops worst practice and provides a floor, a base, and it, it provides certainty for a whole lot of manufacturers and other people to do what they need to do to change what they're doing and produce the materials that they need to do. But we also need inspiration at the top level because I don't think regulation drives that. And I think that's a bit like the moonshot idea of we're going to fly to the moon in 10 years. And the change of mind that that caused, because no one knew how to do it. And rather than going, if you'd said, oh, we're going to do it, I mean, you could have said, oh, we'll try. If we're going to try and do that, people go, well, you can't really do it because of this, this, and this. When you say, we are going to do it, and this is the time frame, your mind switches to, how do we do that? And I think that that sort of very ambitious goal and with a time frame has to be set and then uh, inspiring way, it, we need to then inspire people to say, this is great, this is a great future that we're going to create, and how can you contribute? Because I think we, we just need to work at both ends. Fantastic. And Philip? Sure. Uh, well, look, I think one thing that's not a barrier is technology or our technical knowledge. We know how to do this. Mm. We've known how to do this for, for, for many years now as well. It is, and I think, Barbara, you mentioned the idea of what society do we want to live in. It's, it's willpower. It's a, it's, a, it's a bigger thing now. We know how to do it. We, it needs to become a priority of society, essentially, and and part of that actually absolutely is governance, it's regulation, it's about setting that agenda and putting this at the absolute top. I think that's starting to change, um, but I still think, as you know, the analogy, with the example you talked about earlier about going and seeing a housing development with. Um, lots of dark coloured roofs, no consideration of urban heat island effects. I'm, I'm startled we're still doing this. Mm. Mm. I might bring it back to, um, more specifically, to the, the issue of heritage and uh, cultural heritage. Um, do you think that, um, I mean, in a sense, if we put a positive hat on, this uh, whole opportunity for rebuilding, for renewal, for a new future, if you like, post, uh, well, unfortunately in our country, post-natural disaster and COVID, um, do, you think, uh, do you think there is, is, is this an exciting time? Is this a, an opportunity to do really, really good things? And how could we do that? Is it demonstration projects? Is it incentives, like Caroline said? It is, uh, is, it, is it education? Is it all of the above? Maybe we'll first, Caroline. I think it is all of the above, and I think that, um, it, you know, it's a really interesting thing about what is heritage. So say if we go back to Miller's point, so many houses were not even allowed to put a photovoltaic on their roofs because why? You know, and, and I know um, my husband John and I sometimes debate this as to whether it should be allowed. Right at the moment, I reckon any north-facing roof should be allowed to have a PV on it if it's sensitively installed because, you know, and that, I don't think that's destroying heritage. I think that's saying heritage is moving into the next stage and if those buildings were built today, they would have PVs on them or should have PVs on them. So I think that there's got to be some sensitive... And it goes back to my thing of saying, find out what's really important and honour that. Make sure you honour that. But where other things that are a bit more adaptable, adapt them to be ready, future ready and, and part of the future and do it so that it's gorgeous and beautiful and people then want to do that. And I think that's part of the reason is that what we... The people we honour in society at the moment are the people with great big houses and great big cars and and 
you know, go on expensive holidays all over the world and you kind of go, well, is that really what we should be honouring? I mean, how do we change what is deemed to be great? And I think as chair of One Million Women, we are empowering women to make change through climate and we are providing all sorts of ideas for how to do that and celebrating with them about when they achieve that. And I think that those sorts of moves of... of Enabling people to find their own personal agency and being encouraged is really important. Fantastic. And from other members, please. Sure. I, I, look, I, I'd like to touch on education, that side of things. I think it's very pertinent that, I mean, I, you know, I, I run a, uh, an architecture program and, and we are constantly now looking at changing our curriculum to ensure our students are ready to tackle this in the workplace because the sec by the time they get in the workplace, if you start an architecture degree today, in, in five years' time, every building you design is going to have to be carbon neutral. But that's only a tiny part of it. I think, as has been said before, this idea of upskilling an entire industry, and many, many industries, is a, is a really significant challenge though the ideas of micro credentials and other things and and we, we think this is a big challenge but you know go back a year we took our entire lives online like, over a weekend <laughs> you know I, I can remember that weekend it was not a fun weekend I had many a phone call that weekend as we, we took our our school's programs online but we did it yes there were real real challenges in there but it showed that radical change was possible quickly my big fear is that there is change fatigue now everyone's exhausted um, understandably everyone's exhausted and there might there's talk of this kind of blip we come out the other side people are going to want to go on the big expensive holidays and have a big expensive cars and, and get a bit of that that kind of thing back when we have a much bigger uh, battle to fight thank you and then we're going to go to q a very shortly but uh, so, so in terms of heritage uh, buildings and so forth uh, i guess uh, the, the shine dome might be qualifying for that as well. Um, you, you take any complex like this, there are bits that you might not want to touch perhaps uh, and, and, and there should be allowance for it to be touched. But you can go zero carbon cost effectively now or by 2025 if you really took a uh, approach of other technologies uh, on site including off-site uh, sourcing of renewables, uh, you can go to zero carbon today. So, so a lot of the things we're talking about, if we are driven by this whole climate emergency and the need to go zero ca carbon, uh, you, you could do it now uh, cost effectively. I think that's absolutely right. So um, just to remind, I think there might have been a hand up. I, I was uh, explained by our wonderful chair here, Tracy, at the beginning that we can't actually have microphones and Q&A from the floor. You need to email your question in. Uh, but we have a lot of questions anyway, so uh, we better get on to those. So Tracy. Okay. So there are a lot of um, questions, both from the audience here and the online audience. And I just can't read that far away. So I thought an interesting one to start with would be um, a question. To encourage adaptive reuse, could a resource dissipation tax be levied on developers? And could such a tax account for a loss of intrinsic resources embedded, embe embodied in buildings um, that have still have many years of re residual life? And the questioner brings two examples of recent um, Canberra decisions of demolitions of quite recent buildings, the CSIRO headquarters and the Anzac Park East Portal building being good examples of, um, you know, quite recent buildings that have been demolished in Canberra. I'll let you... To any member? I think um, just to show that Australia is not the only crazy place, um, over in the UK I gather there's a 20% VAT on recycled goods and on recycled buildings or so, do you know and then nothing on new ones I think yeah I think if you they're putting VAT on refurbishment but not a new build yeah yeah which is wild and I think I think you've got to go for all of those options to reverse things like that and um, money speaks and I think it would be very good to start working that out maybe a carbon tax do you think 
Right. I think that, that there needs to be a little, I think I believe in a bit of carrot and a bit of stick as well. So uh, an example I would give it is Singapore. Now Singapore, hot, humid climate suffers from, from the urban heat island. And they mandate any building has got to return 100% of green space, the site area, back to the site. So you put it on the walls, you can put it on sky decks, you can put it in different places. But that is the kind of the mandate. And if you go above that, if you go much higher, you can build a bit taller or you can build a bit more significant. So there is that kind of balance of, you know, the, the regulation, the, the minimum. But if you want to go much further, okay, great, you get an incentive as well. Fantastic. Uh, next question. Uh, should there be a nationwide standard like that being proposed by cities, reference to recent initiatives in Sydney and Melbourne? And assuming so, are these initiatives heading in that direction? What is constraining that discussion? Hmm, I could answer that, but anyway, I'll leave it to the panel. <laughs> Who'd like to go first? Uh, national standards for um, that being proposed by cities in uh, Sydney and Melbourne. It doesn't actually say what standards, but I'm assuming, I would assume it's uh, net zero carbon standards. Yeah, the Sydney, Let's assume that. Sydney last week launched a, a standard uh, for zero carbon yes. uh, and, and predicted a pathway uh, which uh, uh, with a lot of work done underpinning that data. Uh, so, so they've actually put numbers uh, and put measurability and uh, all of that around how you report. Uh, and uh, I think that's a, that's a great idea. That's clearly a next step. Uh, and uh, they do not include uh, embedded carbon in that yet. They did not include renewable energy they, at the moment necessarily. They said you could do that after 2026. Uh, but I think those things can happen now, uh, not necessarily being a tall building dominated environment in CBDs uh, that uh, uh, off-site purchasing, for example, within Sydney, uh, Barangaroo uh, has uh, purchased a lot of off-site. Melbourne as a city has done what ICT has done uh, and what the UNSW as a campus has done uh, to go 100% renewables uh, through purchase. So so Melbourne City did by um, uh, wind energy uh, and UNSW did by photovoltaics uh, and, and uh, I think uh, ICT did by a mix, uh, large yeah. uh, wind as well. Yep. So, so these uh, uh, a good idea. So in a sense, uh, from, from your responses, there's quite a, a groundswell happening at the local level coming through and, and maybe that's what will lead ultimately to some kind of national consensus about uh, action at that level. Yes. Okay, uh, next question. In yellow, <laughs> what opportunities are there within the professional organisations such as the Australian Institute of Architects of movements such as Architects De Declare to advocate for adoption of social, cultural sustainability? Well, I think there's a lot of, um, a lot of room and I'm not only am I a spokesperson for Australian Architects Declare, Dale and I both sit on the Institute of Architects Climate Action Sustainability Task Group, which is sort of trying to do a lot of this. Um, and, you know, the, the Institute is really open to it. It might, some people have said to me, the Institute's not doing much. I, I can actually assure you that they are doing a lot. It, it'll become more apparent. Um, for, for instance, they've worked out they've done an audit and they're going carbon neutral and then they're going to start promoting that to show architects how to do it themselves. They're, we were talking today about um, reaching out after this last lot of natural disasters to help people, which, you know, they had Architects Assist set, set up after the bushfires just this time last year. And so I think that there's a lot of, uh, a lot, architects are very kind and do a lot of work for nothing, which is, no, you know, anyway, not a great idea. But they do reach out and try and help, and I think that that is a, a great thing. I think that um, the person, I, I think not only should the, um, the groups be doing stuff, but what the architects declare is about, it's not about the group being doing stuff, it's about actually empowering architects so that individuals can take action. Because I think that until 
you know, that's the main aim. And then for, for people then to collaborate together to do a lot more. Great. Um, I might give a plug for my own profession in urban planning. Uh, we've established a whole global network. Um, I'm the co-chair of the Planners for Climate Action Global Global Network, based um, in Nairobi, supported by UN Habitat. So it's focused not just on developed nations, but very much actually focused on uh, developing countries, many of which are in our region. So I think we have a, a broader responsibility to our um, uh, Asia-Pacific region in this whole discussion as well. Okay, I think we've got time for maybe one more question. So I've got one here in green this time. Carbon sequestration. Uh, any thoughts on creating uh, forests in urban environments to mitigate carbon emissions? There's a lot of work happening, I know, in this space. So anyone would like to go on? Well, talk I think about the this? city of Sydney's in the middle of planting how many, a million trees or heaps of trees? I mean, they're, they're, there's more trees in Sydney than there were at when Clover and John got in in 2004. Um, it's absolutely the answer to a whole lot of problems, not just carbon sequestration, but urban um, heat island effect, uh, habitat, um, just people learning how to grow things is really good socially. There's so many benefits and I, I think we should be really working out how we rewild our streets and stop letting the cars be the predominant dictator of what happens in our environments and start getting back to nature. Let, let me just cover that from another point of view, the same same overall statement. Uh, so New South Wales government has a plan for five million trees for, for metro, broader metropolitan Sydney. Uh, that comes from largely a uh, urban microclimate uh, management as, uh, strategy, urban heat island and so forth. Uh, so there's lots of follow-up studies done on that and, and, and uh, urban, uh, trees are not the only way of providing uh, mitigation from, from uh, extreme heat in cities. Uh, th uh, there's lots of other uh, approaches, including color, texture, absorptance of surfaces and all of that, uh, from roadways to building facades and, and, and the mix of gr vegetation, urban um, sort of green infrastructure and all of that. So, so there is things in place. We have done a lot of work in this area uh, in terms of uh, providing evidence for better policy, uh, but also uh, in, in terms of uh, urban uh, farming, as they call it, urban vegetation, from, from a food perspective, City of Sydney, again, uh, has done a, uh, and Melbourne, have done uh, input-output analysis on uh, to what extent getting food into the city adds uh, the city carbon footprint, if you like, and, and to what extent looking at uh, geospatial mapping and how much backyard, front yard, rooftops are available, uh, that to what extent you can actually provide uh, food uh, within cities to offset the, the carbon footprint from that source. So there's a lot of knowledge and data available. I think the, the policy folks need to sort of take some of those forward uh, in ter terms of uh, incentivizing some of those. And Carolyn, and then Phil, you can have a final comment there. I think we also need to reforest a lot of our farms because I think when you see the examples of um, just cows like to be under shade, and but also trees encourage sort of much better environments and they encourage water, they encourage water into the soil, the soil can then absorb more carbon. Um, I, I think Charles Massey and his book, um, The Cry of the Reed Warbler, sort of explains a lot about it and there's a number of fabulous films on it at the moment. So I think I think trees are really great and they're very complex systems that help each other. That's a that's a big story of collaboration and cooperation. Certainly. Thank you. And Philip? Oh, look, I think everything Carolyn and Dare have said has eloquently covered it. I mean, I guess what I would, I agree, I think that the value of the urban tree is not to sequester carbon. It's much broader than that. It's it's about urban heat. It's about a place. It's about creating places for children to play. It's about essentially, uh, you know, social and other benefits, which uh, you cannot, and this is, this is the, the big thing, uh, a good point to end on, I guess. You can't measure those qualities in kilograms of CO2. 
you can measure a lot of things in kilogram society, but you can't measure in a great places like way as well. And they're obviously the, of your most importance. Thank you. And um, so it's clear that we talk about a systems approach. We talk about a more integrated approach. We've covered buildings. We've covered precincts. We've covered landscape. We've covered planning in the broader sense. So all the skills that we have here, we need. Um, and I guess just before I hand over, I think what I would like to see is these conversations often around our cities, but I really would like, especially as we start to think more about regional development and country towns, how can the professions help country towns retain their heritage? And as Caroline said, ten men renew and regenerate in their, their environments, because I think that would be a wonderful contribution. So thank you from me, and may I hand it back to our wonderful chair, Tracy. Thank you for the panel. Yes, thanks very much, Barbara. And that was a great um, uh, discussion to round off the, the, the three wonderful presentations, and Barbara's also very inspiring um, response to the presentations. Um, and thank you to our online audience and our in-person audience for um, submitting lots of questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get through them all, but we do have a record um, of them all, and um, our research team for the Sustainable Shine Dome project will certainly um, take those on board and um, uh, see what we can do to respond to those. Um, as you know, as I said at the beginning, the um, proceedings today um, have been filmed and recorded and will be available online, so please share the link when it appears with your students and your colleagues. Um, and w one of the big take-home messages for me today was the need for a stronger link between the sort of research that all of us are doing um, and education and policy makers. Um, and it seems to be in that nexus that there is lots of uh, work for us um, all to be doing. Um, and we hope that in some small way the Sustainable Shine Dome project, because of our wonderful partners with um, uh, the Academy of Science, um, which has such uh, you know, aspirational um, ob objectives uh, for the future of this building, will become a great um, living laboratory for some of these approaches and really you know, getting down to that granular detail of day-to-day -day life um, in a living building um, and, and moving the community and the place and the beautiful collections within it um, through to a carbon neutral future and uh, a more optimistic um, outlook for our, our city uh, as a whole. So thank you once again to our wonderful speakers, thank you to our audience, and as is traditional at these um, occasions in the academy, um, we now can repair to drinks. <laughs> 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 <laughs>